Good afternoon. My name is Kim Sanger. I'm the head of our firm's health law group at Holland and & Hart. And welcome to our first of our webinar series in 2016. Today we're going to be talking about federal fraud and abuse laws affecting health care providers. We, as Holland, at Holland & Hart, we provide uh, monthly webinars for our clients and our friends. They're free. Um, it's, we do it as a client service. If you would like to participate in these webinars in the future, uh, by all means, sign up and we can send you the information so that you can go ahead and uh, participate. What we're going to cover today are those key fraud and abuse laws that affect health care providers, including the False Claims Act, the Anti-Kickback Statute, the Ethics in Physician Referrals Act, more commonly known as STARC, the Civil Monetary Penalties Law. Talk briefly about some state statutes. We're not really going to talk about the reporting and repayment obligations this week, but my partner Pia Dean is going to cover that next week in our webinar. And finally, finally, we'll talk about some compliance programs and some things that you can do to make sure that you remain compliant. Remember that as part of the Affordable Care Act, with all that money that the federal government is going to be shelling out now to provide health care benefits, they want to make sure that they can recoup what they need to recoup. And therefore, under the Affordable Care Act, they beefed up those key fraud and abuse laws to give the government more authority to go back in and recover improper payments that have been made, thereby stretching the Medicare dollars. As far as preliminaries for our materials today, uh, written materials, we've provided copies of the PowerPoint slides. I've given you an article that I did discussing healthcare transactions and the effect of federal fraud and abuse laws on that. Give me a copy of the OIG's Roadmap for New Physicians, its summary of these federal fraud and abuse laws. And I've given you a copy of the relevant portions from the OIG Supplemental Compliance Program Guidance for Hospitals, which is a pretty good summary of the fraud and abuse laws that we're going to be talking about today, particularly if you work with a hospital. If for some reason you didn't get those, by all means let me know and we will provide that to you. This program, like all of our webinars, is recorded and available uh, on our website or on the Internet through the YouTube channel. If you've got questions, by all means, go ahead and submit them using the WebEx chat function, or you can send me an email. I probably won't have time to address the questions during the program today, but I'll get back to you as soon as I can afterwards. Uh, this is an overview of some of the relevant federal laws. These are the ones we deal with most frequently, but that's not comprehensive. So just remember that there may be other laws out there that may apply, particularly state laws. In addition to these federal laws we're going to be talking about, a lot of states have their own versions of these laws. I'll mention that a little bit further. Remember when it comes time to actually applying these laws, the application depends upon the particular facts, including what kind of an entity you are, what kind of claims are being submitted, and the like. With that said, let's talk about the False Claims Act, which is the government's big gun when it comes to addressing false uh, fraud and abuse issues in, in federal health care programs. The False Claims Act says you cannot knowingly submit a false claim for payment to the federal government. In addition, in the wake of the Affordable Care Act, if you have submitted a false claim, then you have an affirmative obligation to narc on yourself. You must report and repay an overpayment that you've received because you submitted a false claim within 60 days or if you're paid on a cost report basis at the time the cost report is due. If you fail to do that, then even though your claim may not have been false when you submitted it because you, it uh, was not knowingly false, if you received the overpayment improperly because maybe you didn't comply with the appropriate regulations once you learn about that, if you fail to report and repay within that 60-day time period, then it turns into a false claim. What are the penalties for a false claim? Well, at the very least, you have to repay the government plus interest. In addition, you can get hit up with civil monetary penalties of $5,500 to $11,000 per claim. Note that that's not per, by, not per um, plan or per, per program. That's per claim that you submitted to the government. So those. Uh, penalties can add up awfully quickly. In addition, you can get hit up with trouble damages, and you can be excluded from the Medicare or Medicaid program, which if you're a health care provider of any significant size, that's probably the death knell for your ability to engage in health care in the United States. In addition to the government coming after you, under the False Claims Act, Private individuals can bring what are called key TAM lawsuits, where they basically act as bounty hunters for the government, and they can sue you on behalf of the government. 
The government can decide whether or not they want to intervene and become a party to that lawsuit, regardless of whether they do, if the key TAM or later, the private party that uh, pursues the lawsuit, if they pursue this or the government pursues it and they get a recovery, that key TAM relator gets a percentage of that recovery. In addition, the prevailing party can recover their costs and attorney's fees. What are some common examples for false claims? Well, certainly for claims for services that were not provided or different than were claimed, or maybe a failure to comply with the quality of care. This is kind of a new theory. The theory is that when you're submitting that claim, you're submitting it to the government stating that, hey, this is you know, appropriate care, it's medically necessary. If you provide what is essentially worthless care, the theory is you're submitting a false claim to the government. In addition, a false claim may arise by, because of your failure to comply with the conditions of payment or relevant fraud and abuse laws. If that condition of payment or the fraud and abuse law says that, hey, you can't submit the claim to the government unless you comply with this stuff and you fail to comply with that stuff, then you are submitting a false claim to the government and you would have an affirmative obligation to report and repay within the 60 days or else you could get hit up with those False Claims Act penalties. As, unfortunately, the Twami Healthcare System found out in a recent case, Drakeford v. Twami, this was a situation where a hospital entered into part-time employment agreements with 19 specialists. Um, one of those specialists was concerned that the uh, hospital was not paying or was paying more than fair market value, was essentially paying for the referrals. He brought a key TAM lawsuit. After several years, the court agreed. And on appeal, it was affirmed. They concluded that they had that hospital to receive payments from Medicare of about $40 million that were false because they violated the Stark Act. So the government um, came up with the penalties. The court imposed the penalties. Well, it's $40 million of damages under the False Claims Act. It's trouble damages. So that ran the total up to about $118 million. In addition, there were 21,730 claims that were submitted improperly because they were violating the Stark Act when they were submitting those claims. Multiply that by $5,500 per claim because of the False Claims Act penalties. That brings the total up for those particular penalties up to about $120 million. The bottom line was there was a $237 million judgment against that hospital. It ultimately settled, I think, in October for about $72 million. That key camera later got $18 million. The bottom line here is you don't want to be anywhere near a False Claims Act case or penalty, unless I guess you're the key camera later and want to recover all that money. All right, so that's the big gun, the False Claims Act. In addition, we've got the anti-kickback statute. The federal anti-kickback statute says that you cannot knowingly and willfully offer, pay, solicit, or receive remuneration to induce referrals for items or services covered by a government program unless that transaction is structured to fit within a regulatory safe harbor. If you don't fit within the safe harbor, the test is, is one purpose of that deal to generate or reward these improper referrals. If one purpose is to generate these improper referrals, then it's a violation of the uh, anti-kickback statute. Even if you had 99 legitimate reasons, if one purpose is to generate improper referrals or to reward or induce improper referrals, then it's a violation. Let's talk about a couple of these uh, aspects of the anti-kickback statute. Note that it only applies if you knowingly and willfully offer pay or solicit. So it is an intent-based statute. You've got to have the improper intent. But remember, it's the one purpose test. That's not very hard for the government to prove. In addition, note that it applies to anybody who offers, pays, solicits, or receives the information. It applies to both parties on both sides of the transaction. It's not just the hospital or the provider who's paying these incentives. It also applies to that provider who, or other person who's receiving those incentives in exchange for uh, the referrals. Note that the anti-kickback statute only applies to these, uh, the intent to induce referrals for government health care programs. So it applies to Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, those types of entities, not necessarily private pay business. However, be careful about that. I've had some clients say, well, we're going to offer these inducements to this physician to make referrals for non-government business. 
but we're not going to give them any inducement to make referrals for government business. In an OIG advisory opinion, the OIG came back and said, well, hey, don't, don't do that. Don't, uh, that still creates potential problems because if you're paying them to send over the non-Medicare business, we know they're also going to send over the Medicare business, and so you're really offering an inducement. At least that's their theory. So you've got to be a little bit careful about those carve-out situations. Note also that ignorance of the law is no excuse. It doesn't matter if you thought that you were doing a deal that complied with the law. The question is whether or not your one purpose was to induce improper referrals. It used to be, at least in the Ninth Circuit where I'm located, that ignorance of the law was an excuse. But as part of the Affordable Care Act, the government amended the statute to confirm that ignorance of the law is no excuse. It doesn't matter whether your marketing person thought this was a good idea or thought this complied with the law. If it violates the anti-kickback statute, good intentions don't really count. Well, what happens if you violate the anti-kickback statute? Hey, unlike the False Claims Act, this, this is a felony. You go to jail for this one. You can get penalized up to five years in prison, a $25,000 criminal fine. You can also get hit up with a $50,000 administrative fine under the civil monetary penalties. You can get hit up with trouble damages and automatic exclusion from Medicare or Medicaid. In addition, in the wake of the, anti, or the Affordable Care Act, an anti-kickback violation now is also an automatic violation of the False Claims Act. That means you can be subject to those False Claims Act penalties and you can be subject to a key TAM suit for an anti-kickback situation. Not only that, Remember the anti-kickback statute, that's a criminal statute, so it's a higher standard of proof. They've got to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. On the other hand, if the government decides to go after you for a False Claims Act violation based on the anti-kickback statute, they only need to establish a preponderance of the evidence. So it's a lower standard of proof. The Affordable Care Act made it easier for the government to go after you for anti-kickback violations. If you think that you've got an anti-kickback problem and you want to go ahead and self-report to the government so the government will take it easier on you, the government in their OIG self-disclosure protocol has said that the minimum settlement that they will accept for a violation of the anti-kickback statute is $50,000. The bottom line is beware of the anti-kickback statute. Anytime you want to give or receive anything to induce or reward referrals or do any deal with a referral source, the bells and the whistles ought to be going off. You ought to be considering, okay, does this violate the anti-kickback statute? What happens if you violate it? Again, a bunch of bad stuff. As DeVita found out, they had to pay $350 million to resolve allegations of illegal kickbacks in 2014. There's a bunch of those other claims that are out there. Now, note that the anti-kickback statute applies to any form of remuneration that if one purpose is to induce or reward referrals for federal program business. It could be paying money, but it doesn't have to be just paying money. It could be offering free or discounted items or services like perks, gifts, space, equipment, meals, paying for insurance, trips, CME, whatever it is. If it has value, then it potentially implicates the anti-kickback statute. It applies to overpayments or underpayments. So maybe you're overpaying this particular physician to provide these services. The government says, that, hey, that amount that you're overpaying them, that must be made, you must be paying them in order to induce referrals. Therefore, it's a violation of the anti-kickback statute unless you've structured it within a safe harbor. It could represent payments for items or services that are not provided. You're paying this physician to provide these services even though the physician is not providing the services, but you continue to pay them anyway. Payments for items or services that are not necessary. Maybe you contract with that physician to provide services, but you really don't need those services. You're really doing it, at least arguably, as a way to funnel money to them so that you can get their referrals. It applies to professional courtesies, waivers of co-pays or deductibles, low interest loans or subsidies, business opportunities that are not commercially reasonable, or anything else of value. The anti-kickback statute is incredibly abroad. It applies to anybody. Not just providers, it could be lawyers, could be marketing people, it could be chief executive officers. It applies to anybody who gives or receives these inducements in order to induce or reward referrals for federal program business. Now, because it is so broad, the government has come up with safe harbors. If you structure a transaction to fit within these regulatory safe harbors, then you're safe. 
It doesn't matter whether you've got improper intent as long as you structure the field to fit within the requirements of a safe harbor. If you structure it to fit within the requirements of a safe harbor, then um, you don't have to uh, satisfy all the safe harbors. You just need to fit within one safe harbor with regard to that particular transaction. Now, you're not required to fit within the safe harbor. It just means that if you don't fit within the safe harbor, you're not safe. That means that you go back to that one purpose test, which of course is a little bit difficult to, to satisfy. Or stated another way, it's easier for the government, relatively easy for the government to establish that one purpose of what you were doing was to generate improper referrals. Now, even though you can't satisfy all the technical requirements of a safe harbor, the closer you come, the safer you're going to be. So even if you can't satisfy one element, if you can satisfy the others, you're going to be safer but not absolutely safe. Well, what are those safe harbors? They're all set out in 42 CFR 1001.952. There are exceptions in safe harbors for bona fide employment contracts, independent contractor arrangements, leases, investments in group practice, investments in ASDs, the sale of a practice, recruitment, certain investment interests, waiver of beneficiary coinsurance deductible amounts, uh, there's also safe harbors for OB malpractice insurance subsidies, referral services, referral arrangements, blah, 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 a whole bunch of others, okay? But the key here is in order to fit within the safe harbor, each of those have a, a bunch of criteria that have to be satisfied. And in order to fit in the safe harbor, you've got to squarely satisfy all of those elements in that safe harbor. If you don't satisfy all the elements, you're not going to be safe. The more you can satisfy, the safer you will be, but you will not be completely safe unless you can structure your deal to fit within one of those regulatory safe harbors. Now, note that there is no de minimis safe harbor. There is no, just, just because you're giving a dinner or something you think of relatively minimal value, there is no safe harbor for that. But quite frankly, the government's got better things to do than to go after you for giving away a free pen or something. The government has indicated in some of its commentary that if you're giving away stuff of more than nominal value, then you're at risk for the anti-kickback statute, but they don't define what nominal value is. Note also there is no fair market value safe harbor. Just because you're paying fair market value for something does not necessarily mean that you're safe under the anti-kickback statute. Fair market value payment does not legitimize a payment if there is otherwise an illegal purpose. But you're probably going to be fairly safe if the remuneration represents fair market value for legitimate needed services or items and is not tied directly or indirectly to the volume or value of referrals. When you're evaluating these uh, safe harbors, consider, or your, your compliance, consider the risk of federal program abuse uh, based on the nature of the transaction. If, to the extent that you can incorporate safeguards to protect against any kind of federal program abuse or improper referrals, then you're probably going to be safer, but not absolutely safe unless you can structure the bill fit within a regulatory safe harbor. Now, the government can issue advisory opinions. If you want to do a deal, you want to know whether the government would come after you for this type of deal, you can submit a request to the government for an advisory uh, opinion. Those advisory opinions have been listed or have been issued or listed on the OIG's fraud and abuse website. You can go in there and take a look at it. So if you're doing a deal, you want to know whether or not the government would approve these, you could go in there and look at the list of these advisory opinions to find out whether there's one that's similar to your deal. If there is, probably if you structure your deal to contain similar safe harbors, you will likely be safe, but there is no guarantee. Those advisory opinions are only binding on the participants in that opinion, not any third parties. But the closer you come to that, to uh, uh, if you act consistent with a favorable advisory opinion, you're probably going to be okay. Of course, the better thing is to structure your deal to fit within regulatory safe harbors. Those advisory opinions, as I mentioned, are all on the Office of Inspector General's website, but you can go in there and search those. Okay, that is the anti-kickback statute. The anti-kickback statute's evil cousin is the Ethics and Patient Referrals Act, more commonly known as the Stark Act, after its sponsor, uh, Representative Pete Stark. It helps to understand the Stark Act if you understand kind of the context in which it came out. The government, 
you know, back in the 80s, early 90s, they were concerned about increasing orders for ancillary services. Medicare and Medicaid, where they were paying a lot more, um, uh, paying a lot more for these ancillary tests that were being ordered by physicians. And the government started thinking, well, well, why? Why are we getting so much, many more of these orders? Why are we paying so much more? They did an investigation and concluded that the reason that they did were a lot of these other, these physicians were opening up their own ancillary services, or, you know, investing in MRI centers or, or labs or things like that. And the government concluded, well, Obviously, if they've got an investment interest in that entity, if they've got a financial relationship with that entity, the more referrals, the more business they send over there, the more money that that physician's going to make, and therefore those physicians really are being incentivized to uh, make referrals over to this other entity, and we don't really like that. Therefore, they came up with the Stark Rule. The Stark Law says that if a physician or the physician's family member has a financial relationship with an entity, okay, the physician may not refer patients to that entity for certain designated health services. And if that physician does make a prohibited referral, that entity may not bill Medicare for those designated health services unless they structure the deal to fit within a regulatory exception. So, note that Stark does not prohibit the financial relationship with a physician and this other entity. So a physician could, for example, have an ownership interest in an MRI company or a PT clinic or a place like that. That's okay. Stark doesn't prohibit that, them from having an ownership interest or an investment or a financial relationship with that. Stark just says, hey, if you've got that financial relationship, physician, you can't make referrals for these certain designated health services to that entity with which you've got a financial relationship. And that other entity can't bill for any prohibited services unless you've structured that deal to fit within a regulatory safe harbor. Well, what happens if you violate that? What happens if you do make those prohibited referrals? Well, the government says that, that it won't make payment for services that are provided per an improper referral. And if you, the government did make those services per uh, improper referrals, then that entity that received the money has an affirmative obligation to repay those repayments improperly received within 60 days. If they fail to make those repayments within 60 days, they can get hit up with civil penalties of $15,000 per claim that was submitted. In addition, if they're trying to come up with some kind of scheme to get around Stark, then it can be $100,000 per scheme. In addition, a violation of the Stark Act usually will also result in a violation of the anti-kickback statute and it's almost certainly going to trigger the False Claims Act as the Tuami Hospital found out. The bottom line is you don't want to violate Stark. Under Stark, remember Stark says that, hey, you can have that financial relationship, it's just you can't make referrals over to that entity for certain items or services payable by federal health care programs. That time period that you can't make those referrals is called the period of disallowance. So Stark says you cannot bill or receive payments for services for prohibited referrals during that period of disallowance. That period of disallowance begins when the financial relationship fails to satisfy one of the safe harbors. And it ends when the relationship is brought into the compliance, but not only prospectively, but you've also, to the extent you've been, uh, the, one of the parties has been overpaid or underpaid in that process, that period of noncompliance does not end until the amount of the overpayment or underpayment are repaid. So if you are a hospital, you do a deal with a cardiologist, and that deal does not satisfy Stark. For example, maybe you're overpaying the, the cardiologist and paying them more than fair market value. Well, you can't bill for those cardiologist services that are payable by Medicare that are designated health services. You can't pay for those designated or uh, bill for those designated health services until you bring that agreement back into compliance and you've gone in and had that cardiologist repay you the amount of the overpayment that's been paid. That period of noncompliance continues for a long time. Obviously, that creates lots of problems. It's just simply a lot better to make sure that your arrangements are structured to satisfy Stark at the outset. Note that prospective compliance alone does not end that period of noncompliance. It's not enough simply to right everything going forward, but you've got to make it right with what occurred in the past in violation of Stark. So when it comes to Stark, 
any financial relationship or item of value between a physician or their family and an entity providing DHS, designated health services, you need to review that to make sure that it complies with Stark. Now, a couple more things about Stark. Oh, and if you don't, you can get hit up with a bunch of penalties, like the Advanced Health System recently had to pay. Uh, they have to pay $118 million as of September. Not good stuff. All right, a couple points about Stark compared to the anti-kickback statute. Note that the anti-kickback statute applies to anybody. Stark, on the other hand, only applies to referrals by a physician to entities with which the physician or their family member has a financial relationship. A physician is an MD, DO, oral surgeon, dentist, podiatrist, optometrist, or chiropractor. Stark would not apply to, for example, referrals by a mid-level. The anti-kickback statute might, but Stark wouldn't. It also, note that Stark also applies to referrals to an entity with which the physician or the physician's family member has a financial interest. So if the physician's spouse is employed by the hospital, then Stark would apply and you need to make sure that that financial relationship between the spouse and the hospital was structured to fit within Stark. <clears throat> the family member includes a spouse, parent, child, sibling, step-parent, step-child, step-sibling, grandparent, grandchild, or in-law. Now, Stark only applies to referrals by physicians to entities with which the physician or their family member has a financial relationship. So there has to be a financial relationship. Now, that financial relationship can be, it's construed very broadly. It could be a direct relationship where there's, you know, a contract with this particular person or the payment comes directly to them. It could also be an indirect relationship where, for example, a physician owns one entity, that entity makes referrals or receives referrals or, or makes referrals or receives payments from another entity. It, that financial relationship could be an ownership or investment interest. It could also be simply a compensation arrangement. That compensation arrangement is basically receiving anything of value. It could be an employment contract, it could be an independent contractor agreement, it could be a lease, payments for gifts, free or discounted items or services, or virtually any other exchange of remuneration would constitute a financial relationship that would implicate Stark. Now, Stark applies to referrals by that physician. Remember, Stark does not prohibit the financial relationship. It just says if you've got that financial relationship physician, you can't make referrals to that designated health service. A referral is very broad. It includes um, any request for services by others. It applies to requests for other providers uh, or or facilities. It could be um, others in the physician's own group. So Stark would even apply if a physician is making referrals to others within their own group. It could apply to referrals to the physician's own employees or contractors. All of those potentially implicate Stark. Now, referral does not include services that a physician personally performs. If the physician personally performs their own services, they're not referring it to uh, those services, and therefore Stark does not apply to services that physician personally performs. But beware um, ancillary technical or facility fees that accompany those physician services. So, for example, uh, a hospital may be able to pay a physician based on the services that the physician personally performs, but they generally can't pay the physician based on uh, ancillary services that are performed by others. Now, there are certain exceptions for services performed by radiologists or pathologists since they usually do not make referrals, but those are kind of special cases. Finally, Stark only applies to referrals for certain designated health services that are payable in whole or part by Medicare and, under, and based on a subsequent act, probably by Medicaid also. <clears throat> Note that um, the anti-kickback statute applies to referrals for any items or services payable by government health care programs. Stark is just limited to referrals for designated health services. The designated health services are those services that are identified on the screen, including things like inpatient and outpatient hospital services, outpatient prescription drugs, clinical labs, therapies, radiology, um, DME, and so forth. The government uh, has a website uh, there's a Stark website that lists the majority of the affected CPT codes. So if you want to know whether or not a particular uh, CPT code is a designated health service for purposes of Stark, you can go onto the government website. Now it doesn't list all of them, but it lists most of them. If you know that it's if it's included in that website, then you know it's covered. If it's not included in that website, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, 
not a designated health service, you just need to be a little bit careful. Now, remember the anti-kickback statute is an intent-based statute. Um, it only applies if one purpose is to induce improper referrals. In contrast, Stark is what we call a strict liability statute. Your intent doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you had any intent to induce referrals or the like. You either comply or you don't comply. There is no good faith compliance. So to comply with Stark, the transaction must either fall outside the statute, meaning that there is no financial relationship or no referral, or you've got a structure of deal to fit within a regulatory safe harbor. There's a limited exception that if an entity receives a referral from a physician, but they really don't know who that physician is and have no reason to know that that physician has a financial relationship with them, and they go ahead and bill for it, then in that situation, they're not necessarily precluded from recovering, but that's a pretty rare circumstance. Now, just like the anti-kickback statute, Stark contains numerous safe harbors. Some of those safe harbors, if you structure the deal to fit within the safe harbor, then you're okay under Stark. Some of them are applicable to both ownership and investment and compensation arrangements. Some of them are applicable to only ownership or investment arrangements. Some of them are applicable to only compensation arrangements. There is no liability under Stark if you comply with all of the requirements of an applicable safe harbor. But you have to comply with all the requirements. Remember, it's, there is no good faith compliance. There is no technical compliance. You either comply or you do. You either comply or you don't. Now, you need only comply with one safe harbor for each financial relationship, but make sure that each of the financial relationships fits within a safe harbor. In those cases, you need to make sure that you're looking at each financial relationship. Some transactions might have multiple financial relationships. You may contract with a physician group, and that physician group also subcontracts with another physician. You have to look at each one of those financial relationships to make sure that they're structured to fit within Stark. Some of the exceptions that apply to both ownership and compensation, the most important are the group practices exception. There's exceptions that allow uh, physicians to make referrals for services to, that are going to be rendered by another physician in the same group or make referrals for in-office ancillary services that are provided through another uh, practitioner in that group practice, so long as the group qualifies as a group practice as defined by Stark. There are a bunch of other exceptions that apply to uh, both compensation and ownership. There are exceptions that apply only to ownership or investment interests. The most significant of these are like the rural provider exception. If you're in a rural area, which is defined as outside a metropolitan statistical area, Stark gives you a lot more leeway than if you were in a metro area. The theory there is that, is that in a rural area, only physicians may want to invest in bringing needed services to that community. So a physician group may want to um, start its own MRI center or something like that. Um, in that situation, if it's in a rural area, the government says, okay, a physician can have an ownership interest in these other entities, that's not going to violate Stark. The same rules would not necessarily apply in a metro area where um, presumably those services would otherwise be available. There's also an exception for investments in the whole hospital. That's the one that allows uh, physicians to have an interest in a specialty hospital. Note, however, that under the Affordable Care Act, there are significant limitations on a physician's ability to acquire a new interest in a hospital and still be able to make referrals to that hospital. What we deal with most often in Stark are exceptions for compensation arrangements. Um, there, some of those safe harbors apply to bona fide employment relationships, personal services contracts, independent contractor arrangements, space or equipment rentals. And last month, uh, the government issued a new safe harbor that applies to timeshare arrangements that is a good alternative to space or equipment rentals. There's exceptions for physician recruitment. Uh, prior to last month, you couldn't, um, there was no safe harbor for mid-level recruitment. There is now a new safe harbor that applies to mid-level recruitment if certain conditions are satisfied. There's exceptions for fair market value, non-monetary compensation up to $300 per year. That's modified based on a CPI adjustment, uh, medical staff incidental benefits, professional courtesies, and so forth. So the bottom line here is whenever you're doing some kind of a relationship with a physician, you've got to stop and ask yourself this. It's the questions for a Stark group analysis. Is there a financial relationship between the provider of designated health services 
and the physician or the physician's family member. Remember, that could be a direct or indirect relationship. It could be an ownership or investment interest. It could be a compensation arrangement. If there is a financial relationship, you've got to be concerned about STAR. Then you've got to ask yourself, does that physician make or has she made referrals to the entity for designated health services payable to Medicare? If she does, you've got to be starting to feel a little bit nervous. Then you've got to ask, okay, does a safe harbor apply? Was that relationship structured to fit within a safe harbor? If it does, then you're okay under START. If it doesn't, well, you've probably got problems. If you're the entity that's billing, you could ask, has the entity billed for items or services pursuant to an improper referral? And if so, did the entity have knowledge of the physician's identity? If you did, then you probably got a Stark issue and you're probably going to have to report and repay to the government. What are some start, uh, common Stark problems that are out there? Well, the physician refers to entities that the physician owns or has an ownership interest in. For example, maybe they've got their own PT clinic or their own radiology center or MRI center, and that's operated separate and apart from the group. That can create issues unless they live in a rural area or practice in a rural area. Compensation arrangements, which pay physicians based on their referrals to others. That is like an eat what you kill for ancillary services, not based on the services the physician personally performs, but you're giving that physician a percentage of services performed by others paying physicians more than fair market value for their services, paying physicians even though the services are not provided or really not needed, giving physicians discounts or freebies like professional courtesies unless you've structured it to fit within an appropriate safe harbor, subsidizing physician practices, giving them free insurance, giving them free space, free equipment, um, financial arrangements without a written contract, amending contracts within a one-year period, leases that fail to satisfy lease safe harbors, uh, among other things, generally per click or on demand or non-exclusive leases won't satisfy the Stark safe harbor and uh, then they violate uh, Stark and cause you problems. Uh, the government has a website dealing with Stark issues. Uh, the uh, Stark is, is enforced through CMS. That website has advisory opinions, FAQs concerning application of Stark. It has the list of designated health services identified by CPT code. It has the self-disclosure protocol, which we'll talk about uh, more next week. If you've got a problem, then um, you can enter into the self-disclosure protocol and basically narc on yourself and the government will go easier on you. It's also got a list of recent Stark settlements. All right, that is Stark. Let's talk now about the Civil Monetary Penalties Law. The Civil Monetary Penalties Law actually groups up bunch of uh, different misconduct together. It prohibits certain different types of specified conduct, such as submitting false or fraudulent claims or misrepresenting facts relevant to services, offering soliciting or giving or receiving remuneration to induce referrals, i.e., the anti-kickback statute. The ones we're going to talk about today are offering inducements to program beneficiaries, offering inducements to physicians to limit their services, submitting claims for services ordered by or contracting with an excluded entity, or failing to report and repay an overpayment. What are the violations for, or what are the penalties for a violation of the Civil Monetary Penalties Law? Well, the penalties depend upon the type of conduct. They range from anywhere from $2,000 to $50,000 fines. In addition, it can be trouble damages, denial of payment, repayment of amounts improperly paid, and exclusion from government programs. Civil monetary penalties violations may also violate the False Claims Act, Anti-Kickback Statute, or Stark, and therefore you may not only have to worry about the CMPL, but maybe you have to worry about those other statutes also. Well, let's talk about some of those specific uh, prohibitions. First, inducement to government program patients. You cannot offer or transfer remuneration to Medicare or a state program beneficiary if you know or should know that the remuneration is likely to influence the beneficiary to order or receive items or services payable at federal or state programs for a particular provider. What does that mean? We don't want you to go out, or the government doesn't want you to go out and offer freebies to federal program beneficiaries so that they will come to you for services. That's the gist. What's the penalty if you do? Well, a fine of $10,000 for each item or service that you provided, trouble damages, repayment of the amounts paid, and exclusion from Medicare or Medicaid. A violation of this provision almost certainly is also a violation of the anti-kickback statute, so you could also be hit up with all of those penalties under the anti-kickback statute and the False Claims Act. 
Well, it only applies to offering remuneration. What do they mean by remuneration again? Remuneration is basically anything of value, including but not limited to waiver of co-pays and deductibles, unless you satisfy certain conditions, and giving items or services for free or less than fair market value unless you satisfy certain conditions. Giving that remuneration to program beneficiaries, patients who are Medicare or Medicaid beneficiaries, can implicate the civil monetary penalties law. Now, remuneration does not include the following. Waivers or co-pays based on financial need or after a failed collection effort if certain conditions are met. So the general rule is, hey, you can't waive co-pays or deductibles to federal program beneficiaries. If you do, that's a violation of the anti-kickback statute likely, but also the civil monetary penalties law. There's an exception that allows you to waive those co-pays or deductibles or if there's demonstrated showing a financial need or after failed collections efforts, so long as you satisfy certain other conditions. For example, you can't advertise this. You don't use that as a marketing gimmick that, hey, come here and we'll do insurance-only billing. Remuneration does not include items or services if financial need and certain conditions are met, incentives to promote delivery of certain types of preventative care, payments meeting an anti-kickback safe harbor, certain retailer coupons, any other remuneration that promotes access to care and poses a low risk of harm to patients in federal health care programs and certain other situations that are specified in the statute. Um, although there is an express regulatory exception, the OIG has approved the following in opinions or comments. They stated that they won't go after you for a civil monetary penalties law violation if you offer free or discounted items or services that are of low value, which they define as each item or services is less than $10 and the aggregate is less than $50 per patient per year. So you could have a program where you give your patients like a, you know, a $10 gift card. Um, so long as each time you give that to them, it's no more than $10, and the total amount of gift cards you gave to a particular patient in a year are, are no more than $50 per patient per year. You can also offer free screenings, so long as those free screenings or exams are not conditioned on or tied to additional services from any provider. There's an advisory opinion on that. The government has also approved free transportation programs. For example, you want to send out your van to, um, to a local rest home or a nursing facility or something like that to get people to come to your, your clinic. The government has approved free transportation programs where the transportation is reasonable and local, open to patients regardless of the payer mix, and certain other transportation options are limited. Okay, so that's generally the general rule is you can't offer in these inducements, these freebies to Medicare beneficiaries in order to get them to come to you for business unless you can structure to fit within one of those designated exceptions. There's another uh, exception or another prohibition under the civil monetary penalties law that says that a hospital or critical access hospital cannot knowingly make a payment directly or indirectly to a physician as an inducement to reduce or limit services provided by Medicare or Medicaid beneficiaries who are under the direct care of that physician. This actually grows out of when the government went to the prospective payment system where they started paying physicians based on a total episode of care in the hospital rather than paying uh, or paying the hospital based on the total episode of care rather than paying for fee for service. The government was concerned that, well, now because hospitals are going to get X dollars for this total uh, episode of care rather than a fee for service, so that creates an incentive for the doctor, for the for the hospitals to cut back on Medicare and Medicaid services, and so they implemented this rule to prohibit hospitals from offering these incentives for, to physicians to cut back on services. That's the gist of it. Note that this would apply to a lot of game sharing programs out there. Those game sharing programs are generally those situations where a hospital comes to a physician and says, "Hey, if you can help us save money." we will share those cost savings with you. And generally, those are prohibited by the civil monetary penalties law as well as potentially the anti-kickback statute and Stark. What are the penalties for a violation? Well, $2,000 for each individual with respect to whom the payment was made and any other penalty that's allowed by law, which could include, again, anti-kickback violations, Stark violations, uh, False Claims Act violations. Now, the OIG has periodically approved game sharing and advisory opinions if certain safeguards are included. 
For example, if the proposed plan does not adversely affect patient care, quality is evaluated by a third party, that there's a low risk that the incentive will lead physicians to provide medically inappropriate care, and the payments are limited in duration and amount. The, those OIG advisory opinions, however, don't apply to STARC. So just because the OIG has issued an advisory opinion that allowed it in certain cases, particularly in cardiac lab cases, they've issued a lot of advisory opinions, don't assume that you can do it and still comply with STARC. Now, some of you may be thinking out there, well, wait a minute, this whole game sharing concept, that's affordable, that's the Affordable Care Act. That is uh, accountable care organizations, right? We want everybody to come together and the government's going to share these cost savings with you. That if you re uh, provide this care more cost effectively and it saves the government money, we're gonna share those, the government's gonna share those cost savings with you. Doesn't that violate the civil monetary penalties law? Yeah, it would, except that the government has come up with new rules that waive the civil monetary penalties law and stark for certain accountable care organizations. So as long as you, if you're a member of an accountable care organization, you can offer these types of gain sharing arrangements as part of your deal, so long as you fit within those regulatory safe harbors. Next one, the civil monetary penalty law states that you cannot submit a claim for an item or services ordered or furnished by an excluded person. So if a physician has been excluded from participating in Medicare and Medicaid and they order services from you and those services are otherwise payable by Medicare, you can't submit that claim to Medicare for those services. You just can't charge the patient or can't bill Medicare for those services. It's not only that, but the government went a step further and says you cannot hire a contract with an excluded entity or arrange for an excluded entity to provide items or services payable by federal programs unless you jump through a whole bunch of hoops and make sure that the federal money that's coming into you is not used in any way, shape, or form to pay that excluded person's salary or, or uh, under the contract. The bottom line here is you can't contract with excluded entities and still participate in the federal Medicare program. That's generally the, the gist of it. What happens if you do? Well, you can get hit up with penalties of $10,000 per item or service provided, treble damages, repayments of the amounts that are paid, and exclusion from Medicare and Medicaid. So for example, I've had several of these situations where the, OI, uh, where the OIGs come in and said, hey, this particular person was excluded. Maybe a physician group hired a receptionist or a biller, and that turns out that person was excluded. The OIG comes in and says, hey, you contracted with this particular person in violation of the civil monetary penalties rule law. Therefore, we are going to require you to repay a certain amount back to us of the amount that you've been paid by Medicare and Medicaid. And the government has a formula where they will take that person's salary, multiply it by the uh, percentage of uh, Medicare and Medicaid business you, you have, and you have to repay that money back to the government. Not a good situation. You don't want to be hiring excluded entities. Uh, now, note that it only applies if you knew or should have known of the exclusion. Uh, there is an exception for certain emergency services, but that knowledge means you knew or should have known of the exclusion or you were notified by HHS of the exclusion. For example, maybe you submitted a claim and you got notice back from the government that, hey, this, this person was excluded, we'll pay the, the claim this time, but not in the future. Or if that person is listed on the government's list of excluded individuals or entities, the government's blacklist for persons who are excluded. That list of excluded individuals and entities is available for everybody to search. And yes, the government expects you to go out and check that database to make sure that you're not employing persons who are excluded. If you are employing persons who are excluded and who are listed on that database, the government may come back in and say, hey, you got to repay us. Well, the question is, how often do we have to check that? That uh, list is updated monthly. Um, in the med there was a letter that went out a few years ago from CMS Medicaid that said that they expected providers to check that list monthly. CMS Medicare did not go quite that far. They do expect you to check the LEIE before hiring or contracting with entities like employees, contractors, vendors, medical staff. So that should be part of your credentialing hiring process. And you need to check that LEIE periodically thereafter. How frequently? Well, to be really safe, you ought to do it on a, on a monthly basis. Um, you may not have to do that that frequently. You may still be able to argue it, but the only way to be really safe is probably check it on a monthly basis. 
you should condition contracts and medical staff membership on, on non-exclusion. So if a person is excluded from Medicare or Medicaid, that that gives you a right to automatically terminate your agreement or kick them off the medical staff because, again, you can't provide services that are ordered by an excluded individual and you can't contract with an excluded individual. If you do receive notice that one of your employees or medical staff members or contractors is excluded, you need to take steps immediately to sever your ties with them or make sure you're not going to bill Medicare for any of the items or services either they order or that you provide that is really the result of that person's employment. Uh, just like with the anti-kickback statute, the OIG may issue advisory opinions concerning the civil monetary penalties law. They're on the OIG's website. Again, those advisory opinions are not binding on anyone other than the participants, but if you structure your transaction to fit within one of those advisory opinions, you're probably going to be safe. Now, that's basically an overview of the federal laws. Remember that there are also potentially state laws out there. I think all states now have their own version of a False Claims Act and likely their own anti-kickback statute. So in addition to complying with the federal laws, you've got to make sure you're complying with the state laws. Some states have their own self-referral law that's kind of a mini Stark law. That's less common than the anti-kickback statute of False Claims Act, but you ought to be familiar with your own state laws. Uh, almost all your Medical Practices Act will have prohibitions against things like fee splitting that may be implicated if you've got a physician who's splitting their fees with non-physicians or physicians with another clinic. There may be a prohibition in your Medical Practices Act about paying for tappers or runners, paying for referral services. There could be healthcare fraud statutes. The bottom line here is you need to make sure that you're aware of your state fraud and abuse laws in addition to the federal law. An important consideration under those state laws is that the federal fraud and abuse laws generally are limited to federal health care programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and the like. Your state fraud and abuse laws, however, may be broader than that. It may not be limited to government programs. For example, the Idaho anti-kickback statute, it applies to private payers as well as government payers. So you need to make sure, you need to check your, your state laws and make sure that um, you're complying with the state laws and make sure that they're know if they're broader than the federal law. In addition, make sure that you're also complying with your payer contracts because your payer contracts may have additional conditions or limits on your ability to bill. And arguably, if you're submitting claims in violation of those requirements, at the minimum, it's a, it's a breach of contract. It could also be health care fraud. So understand what your limits are under your payer contracts. Well, with all of those terrible fraud and abuse penalties that can weigh down upon you, that can rain down upon your head, it's simply better to comply rather than worrying about it or, or fixing it after the fact. So how can you make sure that you do that? Well, having an effective compliance plan is an important factor. The Affordable Care Act will actually require providers to have compliance plans in place as a condition to enrollment. That's part of the, the statute, but we have not receive those implementing regulations, those may be coming down the pipe uh, before too awfully long. Even if it's not mandated by the ACA, compliance plan is still a good idea. Why? Because it may facilitate compliance and avoid repayments and penalties. It may help avoid fraud charges if you had a good faith compliance plan in place and you simply have an employee who uh, violates that, then you may be able to avoid uh, fraud charges, at least for the entity. It may mitigate the penalties because the government said, hey, if you've got an effective compliance plan, that's one of the factors we will take a look at when we are going to assess penalties. And it may improve your performance. Um, having an effective compliance plan may help you facilitate prompt pay sub claim submissions. It may help you identify problems. Usually when I come in there to investigate uh, potential fraud and abuse issues, there's usually about as much uh, undercoding as there is upcoding going on. And having an effective compliance plan can actually help you maximize your payments. It can reduce claims denials, it can improve medical record documentation, it may identify and prevent patient care problems. The bottom line is an effective compliance plan is basically preventative medicine. Now the OIG has issued compliance guidance for different industry segments that they've said, having an effective compliance plan, we recommend that you have these particular elements in your compliance plan. If you want to follow those elements that are set forth in the compliance program guidance, that 
will help protect you if the government comes in and does an investigation. Now, currently you're not mandated to do that. You're not mandated to put into place one of those compliance program guidance. Um, that compliance program guidance is not a compliance plan itself, but if you structure your compliance plan around the seven elements that are in those guidance, then you're probably going to be safer if the government comes in there and does some kind of an investigation. Those elements are things like that are included up there on your screen. Making sure your compliance plan addresses things like internal monitoring and auditing so that you're reviewing your processes, written standards, policies, and procedures. Make sure you have a compliance officer or compliance contacts, maybe a compliance committee. Have education and training for your staff concerning compliance issues. Make sure you've got a process for investigating and responding to alleged violations and, if necessary, appropriate disclosures to government agencies. Make sure you maintain open lines of communication so if your employees think that there is a compliance issue going on, that they've got a way that they can report that and you can address it. And seven, enforce disciplinary standards against uh, persons who are violating your compliance plan. You know, on a document that you took action against employees who are non-compliant. Now, the actual implementation under the guidance depends upon your size. So a small physician practice wouldn't necessarily have to have everything in a large hospital system might need to have. All right, in all right, closing couple of minutes, let me give you a checklist of a few things you may want to do in the wake of everything we've talked about here. Well, now that you're aware of these compliance issues, you want to go back and identify remuneration to your referral sources, providers, facilities, vendors, government program, patients. Consider your contracts, your independent contractor agreements, your employment contracts. Consider your group compensation structures, your leases. Are you getting subsidized or are you paying subsidies or loans? Joint ventures or partnerships, free or discounted items or services. Are you giving away use of space or are you receiving use of space, equipment, personnel, or resources, professional courtesies or the like, free of charge or a discounted basis? Marketing programs, are you doing any marketing programs to beneficiaries or to other um, referral sources that might implicate fraud and abuse laws. What about your financial policies? Or do you have a policy that allows for waiver of co-pays and deductibles or the like? Once you've identified those, those potential relationships, then review those relationships for compliance with a statute or exception. Was there an intent to induce referrals? Do you have a written contract that's signed by the parties? Does that contract comply with the terms well, do the, do the parties comply with the terms of the contract and the, does that contract comply with the regulatory safe harbors? Are you paying or receiving fair market value for legitimate services that are being provided? Is the compensation dependent on the volume of value referrals or is it independent of volume of value referrals? Is the arrangement commercially reasonable and serves legitimate business purposes regardless of the referrals? Once you've done that, you, um, you should also, so that will allow you to evaluate your current relationships to ensure that they are compliant. You need to have a process in place to track and monitor those relationships going forward. It would help if you have a central repository for contracts or deals so that you can find them if you need to take a look at this to make sure that they are, the parties are maintaining compliance. Make sure you have a method to track the contract termination dates so you don't have a situation where the contract lapses and suddenly you don't have a compliant contract. You should have a process for confirming compliance before any payments made, especially you know, at the outset and maybe on renewals. Require a review and approval by a compliance officer, attorney, or other qualified individual who knows the rules. So before you enter into these arrangements, make sure that you've got qualified people who can review your contracts, your joint con transactions with referral sources, benefits or perks to referral sources, including program beneficiaries, your marketing or advertising programs if it involves referral sources or program beneficiaries. Ensure your compliance policies address fraud and abuse laws, the things we've talked about today. You need to train your key personnel regarding compliance, those who are implicated by compliance issues. That would be administration, certainly your compliance officers and committees, human resources, physician relations and medical staff officers, marketing, public relations, governing board members, purchasing accounts payable, all of those entities who may either be involved in developing or identifying potential fraud and abuse issues. And then you want to document that you provided that training. Most of all, if you think that you have a problem, don't do this. Remember 
you've got an affirmative obligation to report and repay within 60 days. If you fail to do that, then it could turn into a false claims act and a lot more penalties can be rained down upon your head. The bottom line is, you know, for most of you who are employed and not an owner, it's not worth it to you to go to jail or to risk your job or your license because of a potential fraud and abuse issue. You're usually better off if there is a problem for addressing it. So if you think you have a problem, suspend payments or claims to, particularly to the government until that problem is resolved. It's one thing to submit the, the claim when you didn't know that there was a problem. It's another thing to submit the claim once you know that there's a problem. If you know there's a problem and you're submitting that claim, hey, that's a false claims act. Uh, investigate the problem per your compliance plan. Make sure you're consistent with your compliance plan. You may want to consider involving an attorney to maintain the attorney-client privilege, which will offer you some protection if there's ever a government investigation. Implement appropriate corrective action, but remember that prospective compliance is not enough. Just because you fix the problem going forward does not mean that you don't have an affirmative obligation to report and repay for the past problems. If there is a repayment that's due, report and repay per applicable law. P will talk about that next week. There are self-disclosure programs that are out there. If you're going to do it under the OIG, if there's a knowing violation of a False Claims Act, Anti-Kickback, or Civil Monetary Penalties Law, you would probably want to use the OIG self-disclosure protocol that Pia will talk about next week. If there's a Stark violation, you're probably going to want to report to CMS per the uh, CMS's self-referral disclosure protocol. As far as additional resources, the government maintains a very helpful website dealing with compliance issues, you can go to oig.gov to the compliance tab. They've got lots of uh, advisory opinions. They've got uh, videos. They've got guidance. They've got fraud uh, alerts. They've got bulletins, a whole bunch of stuff dealing with fraud and abuse issues. If you are a compliance officer or have any responsibilities at all for compliance, you ought to be familiar with the OIG's website. In addition, we do a lot of uh, training and have a lot of materials dealing with the fraud and abuse issues we talked about today, uh, including past webinars on various aspects of the things we've talked about today. If you'd like to get those, those are all for free. You can go to this website uh, uh, that's on your screen, or you can go to YouTube and, and access those. Um, again, all of those are free. We provide those as a client service. As far as upcoming Holland and Hart webinars, as I mentioned, next week, a week from today, PA will be talking about responding to noncompliance in uh, February. That's kind of our HIPAA month in preparation for those of you who need to make HIPAA reports at the end of February. Uh, so on February 4th, I'll be talking about the, an overview of the HIPAA privacy and security rules. On uh, February 11th, we'll be talking about HIPAA for business associates. On February 18th, I'll be talking about responding to HIPAA breach. If you would like to receive our client alerts, or notices of future webinars, just send me an email. We'll make sure you're added to the list. And that is it. Thank you all very much for your participation. If you have questions about anything that we've raised, feel free to shoot me a, an email or use that chat feature, and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful new year.